My name is John Pfeffer. I'd like to welcome you to um, a very exciting event about the Philippines and the recent elections there. Um, I work with Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies here in Washington, DC. We're a progressive think tank, and we've done quite a lot of work on the Philippines in the past, especially my colleagues, John Cavana and San Ho Tree, looking at questions of uh, economic globalization uh, and drug policy. And of course, at Foreign Policy and Focus, we have had uh, columnist Walden Bellow providing numerous commentaries about the situation in the Philippines and the global economy more generally over the years. Uh, today, we're gonna have, as I said, a discussion about uh, the aftermath of the elections in the Philippines, probably some information about uh, the lead up to that election as well, what we should expect uh, in the future. Um, my, I'm very happy to introduce Patrick Peralta. He's been an intern with us uh, for the last several months. He's written a couple of excellent pieces about uh, the Philippines leading up to the election. Um, and Patrick is going to introduce uh, the, the panelists and give you a little bit more information about the format uh, for this uh, event and take it away. Patrick, thank you for, for organizing this event. All right, thank you so much, John. And thank you to everyone for joining and to all our panelists, especially to those in the Philippines. I know uh, it's midnight right now, and so it's not the easiest time to be tuning in for a webinar, especially for a topic this difficult to discuss. Um, but before I start, I just want to uh, give a brief thank you to our sponsors, uh, the Institute for Policy Studies and Foreign Policy in Focus for organizing and promoting this webinar, and also to our other sponsors, the New York Southeast Asia Network, the Weatherhead East Asia Institute at Columbia University, uh, the Philippine Studies Initiative at NYU, the Philippine Global Studies Forum, and the Center for Southeast Asia Studies at UC Berkeley. So just as a little bit of structure for today, um, I'll be doing a moderated discussion with our four panelists for around 40 minutes. And to the audience, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A chat. Um, if it's relevant to the discussion, I might bring it in. But uh, for the most part, I'll put it into our um, 20 minutes of Q&A uh, towards the end of the panel. Um, so let's get started and introduce our four panelists. So first we have Vicente Rafael, who is Professor of History and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Washington, Seattle. He is the author of numerous books, uh, acclaimed books as well, on Philippine history, Uh, Patrick, it seems your audio has gone out. I don't know what happened. So you're on mute. Oh, looks like I was muted. Um, so Professor Raphael, sorry about that, is uh, author of numerous books on Philippine history, politics, and society, including Motherless Tongues, The Promise of the Foreign, Why Love and Other Events in Filipino History, Contracting Colonialism, and most recently, and I have the copy right here, The Sovereign Trickster, which is a great uh, book uh, and look into President Duterte's presidency. Next, we have Cleve Argelis, who is lecturer at the Department of Political Science and Development Studies at De La Salle University. He's also head of research at WR Numa Research and PhD candidate in the Department of Political and Social Change at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. Uh, his research examines contemporary challenges to liberal democracies in Southeast Asia, including democratic decline, disinformation, and populism. Next, we have Lian Buan, who is a reporter of Rappler, the Philippine media organization founded by Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa, and she covers justice, corruption, and impunity. She is also director of the National Union of Journalists of the Philippines and the host, writer, and producer of Rappler's legal podcast, Law of Duterte Land. During the 2022 presidential election, she covered the campaign of Bongbong Marcos Jr. And finally, we have uh, Christina Palabai, who is the Secretary General of Karapatan, a national alliance of human rights organizations and advocates working for the promotion and protection of human rights in the Philippines. As Karapatan's spokesperson, she leads its lobbying efforts for laws against torture and enforced disappearances 
and for the protection of human rights defenders and indemnification of victims during Marcos's martial law. In 2021, Christina was a recipient of the Franco-German Prize for Human Rights and the Rule of Law. All right, so just to begin, um, President, Duterte, uh, President Marcos is uh, taking office on June 30th, which in the Philippines is tomorrow. Um, and I know the, the big question on everyone's mind is, you know, what does this new administration of Bongo Marcos as president and Sarah Duterte as vice president look like? Um, but I think I would also be remiss in not mentioning that the beginning of a new administration is at the same time the end of another one, namely that of President Duterte. So uh, I'm curious to know, as President Duterte leaves office, what are some of his legacies that he leaves behind? And in, in a decade, when we look back at his presidency, is he just a footnote in history? Or is he actually one of the most memorable presidents we've had in Philippine history? Um, and I'll turn to you first, Professor Rafael, because you actually write about this in your book, The Sovereign Trickster, where you examine uh, President Duterte, the way he governs, and a lot of the legacies that we are now left uh, to wrestle with. Yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, webinar and, and for setting all this up. And it's, it's really a delight to meet uh, my, my fellow panelists, uh, who I'm sure have, have a lot to contribute to this discussion. I mean, the question of of uh, Duterte's legacy is something that a lot of people have been parsing uh, recently. And I think it's very important to reckon uh, with his uh, uh, administration and, and the things that, that he leaves behind and how much of this will carry forward in the new administration. Uh, I, th I think with Duterte, I mean, usually when we when we uh, <clears throat> evaluate or when we reckon with a prior administration, you know, the, the, the people usually say, well, you know, it's a mixed bag, you know, just good things, bad things. Uh, with Duterte, it, it, my my sense is that uh, is that the the let's just say uh, the malevolent tends to overshadow the benevolent. Uh, it, it is not to say that uh, there were certain things that happened in this administration. Uh, that wasn't, you know, uh, beneficial. Uh, but but many of these beneficial uh, developments uh, uh, were carried over from the prior administration of Pinoy Aquino. I think he'll be remembered most for his uh, nefarious uh, drug war, the number of of killings, um, extrajudicial killings that emerged from this from this drug war, um, and and of course the drug war is uh, uh, one in a series of many other wars. Uh, that that uh, the Philippines have witnessed. I mean, in my in my own in my own reading, the drug war should be situated within a long history of counterinsurgency uh, in the Philippines and political violence uh, in, 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 that that was propagated by, among other things, uh, the police, uh, the military, and various other uh, armed forces uh, of the state. And this drug war uh, is certainly something that that uh, will be will be remembered. Uh, by Duterte. My sense is uh, this drug war has resulted in, uh, from the point of view, at least my impression from the point of view of the people in those communities, they claim that the drug war has helped uh, secure a sense of peace or a sense of uh, sort of stability, but one that is uh, driven by fear. Uh, it has definitely not ended the problem of drugs as Duterte had promised he would do it. Uh, if anything, what it's done is it's spurred, as I said, the notion that uh, in, 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 in areas where there, there is this insecure sense of criminality, that only uh, a sort of strong extrajudicial solutions are possible. Uh, I think one of the things that's, that, that Duterte leaves behind is the normalization of this notion of extrajudicial solutions. Uh, quote unquote solutions, which, as I said, are not really solutions. Uh, it, the, the, this 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 notion of extrajudicial solutions, uh, including, of course, mass killings, uh, as the as the most effective way of 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 dealing with these this kind of crisis. Uh, and it, it it it's going to be interesting to see how much of this normalization, as I said, carries over uh, into the new administration. So, so I'll stop there and let others contribute because I'm sure many others have uh, other things to say about this. Well, thank you, Professor Raphael, for you know, spotlighting that uh, focus on the drug war in the administration. Um, Pinay, Leon, uh, Cleve, do you have um, any other 
um, thoughts on what kind of legacies President Duterte will leave as he departs public life? Yeah, I, I can I can um, contribute as well. Um, I think it's important context uh, as well that when we talk about the legacies of the of the outgoing president that he will be exiting um, power, he will be exiting the presidency as one of the most popular um, Filipino presidents, um, especially in the nineteen eighty seven in the in the nineteen eighty seven constitution despite the erosion and the attacks of democracy and human rights in the country and how he left Filipinos on their own during the pandemic, he, he, he will end this term with um, this much support um, from, um, from the Filipinos. And because of that, I also think that one of the key legacies, aside from what um, Professor um, Rafael already uh, mentioned, one of the key legacies of um, Duterte is also how he was able to influence a shift in public attitudes on some of the key enduring issues around democracy, uh, questions on human rights, for example. We've, we've already, you know, since 1987, it's, it's, we, there were already attempts to kind of um, undermine what was you know, a product of the, um, the, the fall of the martial law, sort of like this very temporary kind of like convenient consensus around the um, the democratic democratization project. There's been constant attempts to, to undermine that. But I think what um, Duterte did is really um, try to crystallize um, and um, try and successfully shifted public attitudes um, towards a direction against, for example, the project of democratization as well as um, human rights. And I think this will be really one of his enduring uh, legacies and one that uh, many academics, human rights advocates um, in the civil society will have to confront moving uh, forward. Um, so for example, if you see how, um, it, you know, part of it is definitely a trolling and disinformation, but also how you see the behavior of Filipinos online in terms of like how they view human rights, for example, and you know, how human rights has become a really partisan uh, project from the perspective of um, some of this, uh, some of the Filipino population. This is a very dangerous development in terms of the public attitudes, for example, on, on human rights. Uh, the, the other thing I think, and um, I think this is also uh, quite related to where um, the conversation is headed to, I think um, the way that he raised the curtains for the Marcoses is also one of his um, enduring, what will be his enduring legacies and also a very insidious uh, legacy at that. Um, it wasn't really much about these um, elections, you know. Um, I think he 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 played a role um, years before this election, it, it, so he he didn't have to give the endorsement to Marcos Jr. Um, to to his candidacy, right? Because since 2016, since assume, he assumed the presidency, we have seen how he has mobilized state resources to repudiate the memories of the ends of people power, as well as rehabilitate the image of the. Marcus family, um, there were, you know, public instances of him talking about the rule of Ferdinand Marcos and suppose the supposed lasting achievements of the dictatorship. So I think um, this is, as I've said, um, this is shaping up to be one of his insidious legacies that he was able to resurrect and kind of also infuse um, fresh um, energies to what was then something that was already uh, discarded and reject rejected by the Filipino people. Um, Patrick, uh, everyone, thank you. Um, well, uh, from the perspective of human rights advocates like myself, I think it's um, <laughs> it's a very uh, common view among many of us um, who look at the Duterte regime as something that has a legacy of impunity. And this impunity is not just, you know, attributed to um, a single uh, campaign like uh, the drug war. Uh, what uh, Professor um, Rafael described, you know, uh, the the is essentially like a, a shrinking of the space, the small space that we have, you know, of of exercise.
sacrificing our rights. I mean, the basic right to life, that's, that's what was um, violated through and through. No? The next is the right to due process, the right to freedom to uh, express, uh, press freedom, um, association, the right to political dissent. All these things are not just uh, one-off things. No? Um, as we look at the discourse of human rights, all of these are interconnected, interdependent, no? and one right um, you know, is, is very much related to uh, one other thing. No? At the same time, um, we are very concerned that the start, since the start of the um, Duterte presidency uh, of how, on how the concept of human rights was seemingly not only distorted but mangled towards the end. You know? Because as, as what Cleve said, uh, there are various distortions there. <laughs> uh, from there there's this binary uh, between human rights and human life no? and how these concepts are being uh, uh, um, pitted against each other uh, at the same time uh, the concept of sovereignty as to in relation to international human rights obligations no? was being put out there I mean I think this is not unique to Duterte's um, uh, um, language or policies are concerned. No? This is somewhat an expression also of a global phenomenon. No? But at the same time, uh, the, the same old, same old, no? counterinsurgency issues or the specter of uh, public order and safety, how this can be maintained, these are all um, uh, issues uh, that has been um, used. No? to weaponize the law, to weaponize social media, you know, to weaponize practically all the spaces that we have you know, against the people, against those, especially the poor. You know, I cannot underscore how this has impacted the poorer sectors of society. I mean, Leanne and I, and perhaps Cleve, were here. You know? we, can, we can use the internet, speak our minds out, and of course, we face various risks, no? but nothing, I think, beats the risk of those in the community, especially in the urban poor communities and those in the provinces because of the militarized solutions to everything. No? I mean, the, the answer to anything is uh, the kill, kill, kill policy. We did not coin that, no? but it has been repeatedly used by this president. So. Um, we call it impunity because practically no one, no one has been made accountable. No one um, responsible up in this chain of command has been responsible. Only the, you know, the small ones, even the chief of police in Caloocan was not made accountable for uh, the lapses in the case of Kian de los Santos. So um, what more in the other cases, no? in the many other cases that have been not that, that were not put out there through CCTVs. So um, definitely he has a legacy, a bloody legacy of impunity. Oh, it's hard to follow all of that. <laughs> um, but, I'll, but I'll say this, um, I think uh, President Duterte would be leaving with the judiciary in question. Um, uh, he's the first president after the dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr. to have won almost all of his interest cases um, in the Supreme Court. We've never seen that post-EDSA. Um, During the time of Arroyo, his appointees were um, deciding cases against her. Uh, Justice Carpio even wrote the ponente that uh, you know thumbed down the, the attempt to char change the charter to extend her term even even during President Aquino, the Supreme Court um, declared unconstitutional some parts of the DAP, which was really, you know, a, a big blow to the administration. But in the Duterte um, government, he won every everything. He won everything. He's the first president post EDSA to have um, done that. Even uh, the, the 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 trial courts and the appellate courts have been put under siege. You have a judge who had acquitted an activist and was red tagged um, days after. Um, you know, if a judge cannot freely um, render a decision without be having to see her name red tagged on a flyover in EDSA, then um, what kind of um, 
free judiciary that would be. And uh, there have been 66 lawyers killed in six years alone. And that's more than all of the lawyers killed since Marcos combined. Um, and some, um, some people w would want to be careful about framing the 66 lawyers because they don't want to make it seem like martial law was not that bad. They don't want to make it seem like um, we had uh, that martial law was better or that, that in some ways it was a good thing. But uh, there is this number that um, 66 is more than um, from Marcos to Aquino um, combined. And so that, that really um, put a lot of uh, pressure on lawyers. You have um, local police uh, surveying courts on who's, who are the lawyers who represent um, activists or uh, progressives. Uh, I mean, that tr um, trunk the space uh, even more. And as a last thing, the drug war and uh, the template of the drug war, which is also being used as a template for the war on activism and the war on progressives, it's all ar in arbitrary fashion. Uh, so you don't go through due process, you just put people on a list and, and then people on this list um, end up killed. And when you ask lawyers or even um, people inside the justice system, they would say that we had a pretty solid, uh, we have pretty good mechanisms um, in the justice system that could have and should have uh, protected all these people. But when you have a president um, in Malacanang who say you can kill and I will protect you, then uh, that is one the one word of one man subverting all of these systems um, and mechanisms. So I would say that the legacy would be that he put the judiciary under question. Well, thank you all. I think, you know, the, to sum it up, the Philippines is moving increasingly towards authoritarianism. I think that's that's the legacy of Duterte. Targeted violence, uh, indiscriminate violence, but all in all, uh, a huge growth in, in political violence and disregard for democracy. And so um, it's really shocking for a lot of people in the West, maybe still in the Philippines, that the winner of the 2022 election is the son of a dictator. Not only did we have six years of President Duterte, the Filipinos want six more years of, of a, a possible dictatorship or at least ties to dictatorship. Um, and he was the, uh, he's the first majority president since 1981 uh, when his father uh, uh, accumulated um, all those votes. And so I am curious, how do you make sense of this historical 180, where in 1986 during the Edsa revolution, people were clamoring in the streets, uh, nuns and, and civil society groups were banding together, you could confronting tanks, very you know reminiscent of Tiananmen Square in, in Beijing. How do we make sense of this historical 180? And um, Leanne, if I could go to you again, uh, you reported on Senator Marcos as you followed him closely on the campaign trail. What can you tell us about um, his supporters and also the reasons for supporting him? Um, yeah, I would, I would take off from your premise, which is that some many people are surprised that uh, 31 million people chose uh, the son of dictator. But I think for me, because I followed his campaign even before the official campaign period, and when he launched his campaign in February, I kind of knew that if there's no change with the way that the uh, other candidates would would attack the their candidacy and their campaign that he was going to win. Um, I knew it as early as February, and I knew it even more as we progressed into the campaign period, and I met um, more people. Um, I leave the political analysis to Cleve and Professor Rafael and Tina, but what I saw during the campaign is that we are coming out of a pandemic. Um, people are hungry. People lost their jobs many of the things that should have been, I mean, that what we think should be forefront of a campaign discussion, does it make sense to them? Um, for example, when Senator Laxon talks about bottom-up budgeting, it doesn't make sense um, to a lot of people. When Vice President Lenny Robredo talks about participatory government, it doesn't make sense to um, a lot of people. What the Marcos campaign did was they figured out I don't know how they figure it out, but they figure, figured out that Filipinos have uh, are wired to, to turn into something that makes them feel good. So if you're coming out of a pandemic and these things don't matter to you, the economy is sinking, um, you have lost uh, your jobs, 
what is the one tangible thing that would make you feel good? It's not all those big words. It's unity. It's the promise that when you elect us, you will be happy and you will feel good because there will be no more bickering. That's And that's the campaign they run on. They said that uh, they were going to be friends with the opposition, um, that even though they have been battered for the last 36 years, they would treat these people as friends. So it's this kind of messaging that worked with a lot of people. And that's what the people told me on the ground, is that uh, they just want to stop fighting. It's just, they just want to transition into a, into a society where everyone um, uh, goes along uh, with, with everybody. And I think that's what a lot of us, me included, realized very late, that it was a powerful message and we made fun of it early on. I, I think you know, that's very reminiscent to President Duterte's campaign where he was running on an emotion, which is law and order, the need for immediate solutions. Um, this is a more you know tangible you know unity, everyone together. Um, but it was also interesting with that's similar with President Duterte and now incoming President Marcos is the role of social media in facilitating um, mass emotion towards the mobilization of votes. Um, and so I wanna ask you, Cleve, because you studied this, uh, this is a lot, what a lot of your work focuses on. Um, can you talk about the role of social media in uh, the 22, 2022 elections, you know, especially as reports have shown the increasing and oftentimes harassing influence of uh, troll armies and bots and, and the like. Um, right. Um, and um, I'm building on um, what uh, Lian uh, just said that um, because we were also WR numero, um, we were also do doing polling. We were also doing weekly polling during um, the election, uh, actually even before the start of the official campaign period. Um, and as so what Lian said, um, we've actually discovered that the majority of the Filipinos, around 55% of the 55% of the voters, actually decided, uh, were actually already decided on who they will vote for even before the start of the campaign period. So you have most of your voters already decided. And part of the reason, and I say only part because definitely the disinformation explanation, the disinformation narrative is not going to explain this whole phenomenon. It's uh, more complex than that. But th that is also a significant part of the story. And I think uh, one of the key evidence for that is that you know the voters were already decided even before the start of the campaign period because for the past six years, um, the Marcos disinformation uh, machinery uh, was already put into place. And what happened during the election, the, when the campaign period started, when the official campaigning really started, was that they were just reaping the benefits of their investment in this massive online disinformation machinery um, that they have been operating, right? And, you know, um, there, there are studies, um, for example, um, from researchers at the UP uh, Third World Study Center showing that the on-the-ground disinformation campaigns in select communities have been in place for far longer. And so what we have observed in the um, actual campaign period was that um, the pro marcos disinformation um, campaigns have reached this point that they've already, you know, tried are that they, they were already the dominant voice in social media platforms, especially platforms that are popular to a cross-section of Filipino voters, including, for example, um, Facebook and uh, YouTube. Um, and the, these, these information campaigns, um, we think at WR Numero, for example, have been um, very effective because we've done almost 500 plus um, interviews among Marcos Duterte voters around the country. This is aside from the weekly surveys that we were doing for the election and that you know what we've um, heard from these interviews is that many of the voting considerations of their own voters were significantly shaped by the disinformative narratives that were made popular online by the Marcos disinformation machinery for example just imagine um, voters really being convinced and really um, proudly saying that the primary reason why they're voting for the Marcos, uh, that why they're supporting the Marcos junior candidacy is because um, Lenny, the vice president, is Lugao. I mean, 
this is really just you know a, a narrative that was made popular online by the Marcos information uh, machinery. But aside from that, um, other voting, voting considerations were the fact that they think that the Philippine martial law years was the country's golden era, that the Marcos legacy is that of the public infrastructures people supposedly enjoy today. Um, I, I don't see them in EDSA enjoying any kind of this public infrastructure. Um, and that the plunder of state resources that the dictatorship um, and, the, and their cronies committed um, is just nothing but a product of yellow uh, propaganda. I think um, I think we one of our one of our other important observations as well was that the Marcos disinformation machinery was also systematically trying to target young voters in several social media platforms, including, for example, TikTok, which is very popular among young people. And they were designed to portray the Marcos family as um, authentic, hip, and relatable, um, sort of like political celebrities. Uh, while, while all the while the family's leadership and of the some of the country's cases of corruption and human rights abuses were being uh, downplayed. For instance, this was very uh, personally interesting to me. I saw video. Uh, I saw videos. This was recommended to me by a TikTok user, um, and the videos uh, were showing how Imelda was justifying the use of government resources for her personal excesses. Um, clothes, um, uh, paintings, etc., because so supposedly this represents the uniquely Filipino philosophy of beauty. And some of the comments were really positive. I think because I'm um, exposed to um, the disinformation um, research, I, I I I definitely recognize that some of the comments are just manufactured and you know um, automated. But there were also also very um, authentic, organic um, engagements, and they were very positive in nature. I think I would describe that, um, as I said um, in the beginning, that the role of this information is quite um, significant, but it, is, it isn't the entire story of the Marcus victim. So it, it looks like uh, there's violence in President Duterte's uh, presidency. There's the influx of disinformation and lies. And so, I mean, the future <laughs> does not look uh, bright for the Philippines in terms of a of, of, uh, democratic promise. And so I'm curious um, if all of you could comment briefly, because um, you were all part of civil society, you know, academia, um, human rights organizations, the media. What is What do you think the future of human rights um, will look like under this new administration? Have we already gotten indications from the Marcos administration that you know, they will crack down on political dissidents, or is it, is he, you know, moving in a different direction from his father and from President Duterte? Um, uh, I'll, start with, I'll start with, um, if I can start with Professor Raphael, because um, just so that you historicize this moment, is this something, is this political violence uh, going to be worse, do you think, or is it, um, how do we understand uh, a new Marcos in power? Yeah, th uh, th thanks for that question. Uh, let, let, can I just quickly comment on the question of disinformation? Because um, uh, the way sort of to think about the question of disinformation is that um, it's part of, you know, what Gramsci calls a, a war of position, right? A war of position where uh, different historical blocks contend for hegemony. And uh, key to that contention, key to that conflict is the ability to be able to extract the consent uh, of people uh, to join that particular historical block. Uh, and so really the, the question of disinformation is always linked to the question of consent, right? And to the extent that that disinformation or misinformation works is to the extent that people consent uh, to the narrative that, that, that they're being given. So the question becomes, well, what, what's the key to that consent? Are, are people just stupid? Do they just accept everything that's given to them? Uh, or, or is there something there, as, as Liang and, uh, 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 suggested earlier, is there something in, in the narrative they're receiving uh, that, that to them appears to be compelling in that particular historical moment that, that with COVID uh, and, and, and sort of the generalized precarity? That people live in uh, that they that they accept because I mean you could argue that the Lenny Kiko uh, opposition uh, tried to provide similar narratives of compassion of care 
of, of participation. Uh, and, and, and many people responded positively to that. And yet it was the Bong Bong uh, Sarah uh, team that managed to edge out uh, Lenny Kiko uh, and, and sort of revive this idea that, that somehow they were the better uh, caretaker. So, so th I think that's that's the persistent question that we haven't really answered yet. Right? Where does, what is the basis of consent? If you can figure that out, we can figure out the question of popularity. Uh, to, to, to your other question about, about um, <clears throat> and, and I have some thoughts about that later if you want. Uh, to, to go back to the question that, that you posed, uh, what is the future of, of what is it human rights or violence? Is that what you, was that the original question? Is that right, Patrick? Civil society in general, yes. The future yeah. of society actors. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, again, it, dep it depends what you mean by civil society because civil society in the Philippines, of course you have progressives, you have human rights advocates, you have journalists, you have academics, right? But you also have people like uh, uh, Filipino capitalists, businessmen, you have the church uh, and, 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 and you know, various other folks. Uh, and, and I think I, it, it, it's split, you know, what, what can I say? I mean, it, it, there's no, there's no, uh, despite the claims of unification, there's no, there's no consensus as to you know what constitutes civil society and where civil society is headed. I mean, it, it, the support for Marcos came not only from from the lower classes; it came from the many, many members of the upper classes who who saw uh, BPM and Sarah as uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 people that would protect their interests. For example, clamp down on labor unions. Uh, you know, secure uh, judicial de decisions that would be uh, sort of uh, favorable to their causes, uh, maintain law and order, especially in the case of Sarah, who is uh, as who people assume would continue the legacy of her father, um, uh, secure advantages for wealthy, uh, you know, reopen the whole process of cronyism, maybe expand cronyism to benefit uh, more rich people, uh, contain. Uh, and, and, and dominate the, 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 not just the judiciary, but the legislature to make sure they pass laws that are, are favorable to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you have a civil society that's pretty split along these different lines. Um, somebody in the comment section said, you know, the lasting legacies of Duterte is to ensure the return of the Marcoses. That is true. And I would extend that to say that he is actually, despite his pronouncements to the contrary in earlier parts of this administration, he has certainly secured the return of the, the return and expansion of political dynasties and the political dynasties in the Philippines are stronger than ever before. Uh, and so in some ways you could, you, you could say that, that moving forward, you know, we could look at the BBM uh, Duterte uh, administration as in some ways a, a, a continualist, you know, continuous, to borrow again that term continuismo, right? There was no rupture. Uh, and, and simply because I want to suggest this, there was no, I don't think people really perceived crisis of authority uh, in the Duterte administration. And so they preferred at least the majority to 31 million would put it for Marcos. They preferred a continuation of what they had seen uh, under Duterte. Now, unlike GMA, for example, uh, Gloria Mukapagal Arroyo during her term, uh, it's clearly a crisis. They voted for Pinoy uh, in 1986 when they overthrew Marcos, clearly a crisis of authority uh, that ushered in Cory Aquino. I don't think there was a similar sense of crisis of authority uh, under Duterte, they liked the, they liked that particular kind of leadership, uh, which is obviously why why they continued to vote for Marcos. So, uh, it, what this what this means for for things like uh, uh, human rights, for uh, uh, protection of progressive voices, and so forth. Uh, it's obviously bad news. I mean, red tagging will continue, uh, censorship will continue. Uh, it, it, in a way, it will become even worse. I think. Uh, uh, it will, you know, as, as we've already seen, the way they've been climbing down on, on certain figures. Um, and again, again, this is consistent with this idea that if not from Bong Bong, at least from those around him, uh, the Justice Department and various other people, uh, that the red tagging will continue, will expand. Uh, and, and there's real fear. I mean, li let's not forget Lila de Lima is still in prison, you know, and, and God only knows what's going to happen to her. So. Uh, I, I, I think I think in terms of human rights, it's it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be bad. Uh, Christina, I believe you also had uh, some comments too. Mm -hmm. Well, 
on on the um, issue of disinformation and how the informa- disinformation machine, you know, um, uh, chugged on <laughs> during the election campaigns. Um, I think these this these kinds of campaigns are also rooted in some objective reality of of what the people on the streets we conducted truth campaigns na? and in a sense what people were saying um more more loudly than many others is that two things now struck us one uh they think that nothing much has changed hmm, since 1986 i mean their quality of life their uh their their how they live from day to day no uh, and second, how candidates um, would respond to issues, to gut issues. I mean, human rights is up here. <laughs> Sometimes we human rights activists um, uh, uh, forget that uh, civil and political rights are concepts which are felt when your rights are directly violated. Now, but day to day, violence comes uh to ordinary filipinos especially to poor communities because they don't have anything to eat you know? and they're suffering under during a pandemic in one of the worst unemployment crises in history uh in the country so um i think this this information machine is also dependent on those lived realities eh? you know? on of, of of the lives of those uh, majority of the voters um and one thing that may uh, that that the opposition may look at is how do we address you know, these issues clearly um and you know pointedly uh in a manner that will truly address these needs you know, immediate and you know strategic needs of of the people um this information will always be there. I think, especially during this time of uh, social media, uh, with all this uh, disinformation um, tools. Uh, but at the same time, we should also look at how people are really living from day to day. I mean, they do not just say that we're okay with Marcos, with or we're okay with uh, unity. Um, it's also because. They received lots of money. Eh? There was really rampant vote buying <laughs> in the Philippines. Uh, they 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 earned fifteen to seventeen thousand in these elections per person. So it's something also. No, it it contributed to the concept of that thirty one million. So it's whether it's true or not. No, uh, what is uh, clear is that that people are grasping uh, at issues or candidates um, who are addressing these issues. Um, at the same time, what um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Rafael said on um, the prospects, I think there are two things lang, eh, uh, that, that indicates uh, the future you know, of human rights in, in under a Marcos presidency. One is the continuing non-acknowledgement of the crimes committed the atrocities committed during the marcos dictatorship that is a very big indication of where we are going uh, because it speaks to issues of accountability uh, and of um, in recognition of what whatever is in the law this is in the law already eh? um, the human rights victims reparations act no? and if that is not acknowledged as it as it is no? then um there are many things that the Marcoses uh, will really do, will, will seem to, to be geared at doing uh, in terms of um, the uh, structures, the, the, the infrastructure of impunity that we were speaking about, how this was maintained since the time of martial law until um, the present. The second indication are the statements uh, by the pre- by by incoming um, president Marcos Jr. You no, know, he said that um, he will not uh, um, agree to an ICC investigation you know, on the drug war, and the second is that um, he is keen on continuing the role of the NTF-LCAP. These are two big issues you know, that affects 
uh, the exercise of human rights and uh, the protection of civic space in the country. And if he said those during the election campaign period, beware, uh, President Duterte also said many things <laughs> during his election campaign period. And all those things, he did all those things. No? So um, um, with these statements, previous statements of Bongbong, uh, we expect what a bleaker uh, human rights um, situation or landscape in the coming months or years. Thank you, Tina. Uh, so we are running uh, a little close to time, so I do want to incorporate uh, some of the questions that have already come in. Um, and so we have a question from Maria. So she says, um, for the panelists, would you say that the Duterte regime was able to institutionalize violence, uh, disregard for human rights, and disregard for democracy. Um, so I guess just in other words, what are sort of like the the formal mechanisms, the institutional mechanisms that President Duterte has been able to create violence aside from you know just his speeches? Um, uh, Lian, do you, did you want to comment? Yeah, uh, I mean, the drug war is will continue. Um, President Marcos has said that he will continue the drug war. The, the circular of the PNP that was, I mean, the root of all policy, which allowed um, policemen to neutralize, which to a lot of lawyers meant to kill, um, is still there. It, it hasn't been revoked. Much, to, uh, much of the legal framework of the drug war that allows um, policemen to knock on the doors of um, suspected drug um, addicts are still there. So yes, um, for a lot, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, President Duterte institutionalized violence, and and he he enabled or emboldened um, law enforcement to follow the template wherever they go. So they were able to execute search warrants and then just kill um, and then just uh, use the narrative of nanlaban um, or fighting back. And we've seen this with uh, the activists who were killed um, also in the execution of, uh, of warrants. And even the obtaining of warrants has also been um, institutionalized. I mean, uh, you have judges uh, issuing warrants for jurisdictions that are there are uh, for places that are, that are outside um, their jurisdictions, and the Supreme Court revoked that power already. But um, the, the fact that it went on for so many years, and the fact that um, it's there, means that it's gonna last uh, for a long time. Um, and also, I wanted to add earlier of how we transition to President Marcos uh, from um, from the POV of someone who works in the business of information flow. President Duterte was really, you know. Um, uh, he, the, the information sphere of President Duterte, is just, he just demonizes everyone. He just attacks everyone without regard for any courtesies or pleasantries. Um, and we've had to endure that and uh, confront that and rebuild. What President Marcos will be doing would be a narrative, uh, a strict control of information um, and narrative. So he will be continuing the feel-good um, information sphere that's all good and shiny and everything like that and um he, he the the cap the the camp has not changed since the campaign they keep most of the information secret um even uh, the the meetings with diplomats or even other meetings wherever he goes it's not really that open um to journalists so they just release vlogs uh, that are very edited in a fancy way with good music um, and when you do, uh, when you do discover where he's going or the schedule, there would be a fence so that journalists do not get to see what's really going on. And so you just have to settle for the vlog releases uh, at the end of the day. Um, and that scares me. Um, honestly, to death, because I don't want to be, uh, I don't, I mean, for the, I, I'm, it's not classifying what Duterte did, but at least you were there. I mean, you were, I there were killings, but you were there on the ground, so you could report um, what whatever you want to see. I I don't want a future. I don't want the next six years to be just journalists being forced to settle for vlogs that are released uh, at the end of the day because that's uh, what I think that he's um, going. And so I think that that's really what's the most alarming for me um, as a journalist. And it should alarm everybody because, well, um, at the end of the day, everybody is in the business of truth. I was just reminded when you were saying how journalists don't really get access to you know, his travels, how 
not even six days after he won, he was in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, people were defending him going there. And when uh, the vice president was in New York for her daughter's graduation, uh, there were so many attacks against her, even though they were doing the same thing, which is, you know, traveling abroad. Um, so I want to bring in another question um, from Epi, and this is directed to Cleve and Liam. So she says uh, that uh, there was mention of the tendency of the current Philippine Supreme Court justices to favor the outgoing administration, especially in light of yesterday's decision on the Marcos's DQ cases. How do you see this playing a role in making social media platforms accountable similar to how other jurisdictions are acting upon the issue by taking social media platforms to court and making them pay damages to victims of cyberbullying, similar to what is currently happening to Maria Ressa. Um, so Cleve, do you wanna uh, take a crack at it? Yeah, I, I'll just answer this very quickly. I was, I was so we, we just organized uh, a webinar at um, the Australian National University uh, very recently. And I'm going to share some of the findings of uh, Bjorn Dreschel and uh, Christina uh, Bonoan um, about their study on the emerging factional alliances in the Philippine Supreme Court. And I think this is also building on what um, Lian said about the behavior of the Duterte appointed justices. So what they did is to look at the past, um, what they call past mega political cases. So cases involving, you know, constitutional issues, cases involving the interests of the uh, chief executive, the administration, etc. And um, they found evidence that the, the 30 appointed uh, justices have been voting together as a faction um, as strongly as we haven't seen um, before uh, compared to the Aquino appointed justices and even compared to the Arroyo appointed justices. For example, and Arroyo, remember, is um, the longest serving president of the current um, constitution um, at nine years. Um, and and um, another very interesting uh, finding from their uh, study is that they are since uh, the midterm election since 2019, they've also started to observe that the Arroyo appointed justices are starting to also vote um, with the Duterte appointed uh, justices. So I think in terms of like emerging factional um, alliances, it's something that we could expect uh, moving forward um, that um, there will be uh, this very strong, tight, solid block in the Supreme Court um, represented by um, the Terte and Arroyo appointed justices voting together um, and defending in the judiciary the executive interest of um, Marcos Jr. And definitely that's not, um, that's not good news in the sense that um, because they've already, they already have a, uh, the majority control in both houses of the Congress and for the Supreme Court to also align with the interests of the Marcos Jr. administration, that will just mean that um, we won't be able to expect any formal institutional checks and balances in this government. Uh, yeah, can I answer the question on social media? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put, I wouldn't hope too much that we will soon see um, a kind of a judiciary that tackles um, social media and how we can make them accountable. I mean, we could, free speech is always a tricky subject to litigate. Um, and that's why much of the rest of the world is having a difficulty um, confronting this issue. M more so than in the Philippines, we're not that um, sophisticated. Um, our uh, judiciary has a tendency to go by the books. I mean, we can't even prosecute red tagging. I mean, I know there's no crime criminalizing red tagging, but uh, the group of Tina and Karapatan has um, used different framework. Uh, we have the international humanitarian law. Um, we have a civil code. We have graph. We have other criminal uh, criminal laws that could probably encompass some of the offenses that might have potentially been violated when someone red tags. But still, we are not seeing any prosecution um, for red tagging. I mean, um, and when uh, we can't even maximize uh, the IHL, we when our treatment of human rights cases has always been in the lens of the vice penal code. It's always murder or kidnapping or torture. When we have so many human rights uh, 
um, laws uh, enacted post EDSA, like the anti torture law, but we can't seem to go past what we've been used to, which is the revised penal code and all the other laws. And then we have cybercrime that is very young um, and it's, it, it's a very contested law. Um, and when you see how the Duterte government tried to crack down on the critics during the pandemic, uh, you would see that even law enforcement do not know how to secure a cyber warrant. So I don't think that we should put too much hope at least in the Philippines, that we would see very soon uh, that we could litigate um, accountability of social media um, and disinformation. We're just going to have to do it ourselves for now, I'm afraid. So thank you so much. I want to close this out with one more question, um, sort of uh, looking at uh, what people can do to resist, because I know the for human rights advocates for civil society, it's very bleak, um, you know, six more years of potential authoritarianism, um, more violence, more disinformation, more um, lawfare, more uh, court corruption. Um, so there's a question from Efren, and I'll adapt it a bit, um, asking what can we do to expose the continuing situation of human rights violations under Marcos? And just to expand, um, what are ways that Filipinos in the Philippines, but also, I guess, in the diaspora as well, Filipino Americans, um, other Filipinos, what they what can they do to resist um, what might be a disastrous moment for liberal democracy in the Philippines? Um, and T9, Professor Rafael, uh, did you want to share any comments? Well, um, I think there's a very broad menu of of things that can be done, yeah? and one thing that. Um, can immediately be done by um, those in the U.S. would be to band together. I mean, it's 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 we did that you know, during the election campaign period, and um, we hope that this can continue. These efforts can continue uh, working together, forming various groups. The more, the merrier. Uh, that's that's what we learned you know, during the election campaign period. At the same time, there are also ways by which um, there's pressure on the U.S. government. You know, number one, to uh, I think there there is a pending bill filed by Representative Susan Wild, uh, the Philippine Human Rights Act. You know, uh, it's a bill that um, uh, asks the U.S. government to either um, um, reduce military and police aid you know, to the Philippine government because this is being used to fund uh, and engender human rights violations of the police and of the military. And um, that's one thing that uh, those in the U.S. can support, as well as many other initiatives, uh, resolutions on Maria Reza uh, and on Senator Laila de Lima. Um, those are, are things uh, that can be directed to pressure points in the U.S. itself. You know? Um, at the same time, of course, there are many efforts here in the Philippines. I heard of some efforts by uh, those doing um, archiving work, uh, record keeping work you know, to help us in um, under the debt. That's very important work as well. And of course, do statements, speak out on social media on issues concerning human rights victims, violations victims. Because Junior, I think he's sensitive to the international communities, more sensitive huh, to the international community's opinions and views. I mean, the way he's acting right now, talking to various uh, members of the diplomatic corps promising to go to the UN General Assembly uh, in September uh, this year in New York, those are, you know, uh, um, uh, opening salvo niya yun eh, you know, for uh, a diplomatic, uh, for, for the diplomatic community uh, to give him a red carpet, you know. And I think there needs to be uh, more, more work especially by the international community of the Filipino diaspora outside. Because, you know, when spaces close here in the Philippines,
Philippines, we'll never know how it, it would look like. You know? And so, uh, like during the Marcos dictatorship, uh, the international community's um, uh, role is much more important during under this administration. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Tinay. And Professor Rafael, you have the last word. What can we do to resist uh, <laughs> creeping authoritarianism in the Philippines? I, I, I agree with many of the things that Tinay said. I think continued international pressure uh, wherever and whenever it comes. Uh, for example, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the continuing ICC investigations uh, and if it spills over into the current administration. Uh, so international pressure, uh, the pressure from, from, from organized Filipino diaspora uh, voices, I, I think will be, will be very, very helpful. Uh, I think education, I mean, you, you know, especially from below, if, 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 wherever and whenever it's possible, uh, to introduce the question of human rights uh, in our educational system, uh, if, if, if that's at all conceivable, especially, uh, I, I mean, I know it's gonna be very difficult because of Sarah Duterte's uh, uh, sort of uh, handling management of that of that particular department. Uh, I think journalists will continue to play uh, an incredibly, incredibly important role, uh, as Leon uh, had mentioned. Uh, you know, so much of our information about uh, what's going on it comes from the writings of independent journalists, uh, the counter, the vloggers uh, that seem to be dominating. Uh, the flow of information. Uh, so, and, and academics, I mean, you know, I, I had to make a pitch for my own profession, uh, who uh, I, I think it's, it's incumbent upon them to, to look at this particular moment, uh, as Cleve has shown, and, you know, uh, other people have shown, uh, to look at this particular moment of transition, uh, to historicize it, and to uh, situate it within the context of, you know, the longer uh, sort of uh, a view of, of uh, Philippine political history. So, so these are all, you know, sorts of resistances that we can do. We haven't talked about the Philippine left uh, and, and uh, it'd be very interesting to see how uh, the Philippine left in all its configurations, because of course the Philippine left is a very complicated formation uh, and, 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 and how it's gonna respond to the present moment. Is it gonna continue? But it's, it, it, you know, th th there's a part of the Philippine left that is sort of, uh, uh, you know, very much invested in continuing sort of armed uh, struggle. Uh, will they continue in that direction? Uh, there's another contingent of the Philippine left that is uh, sort of much more concerned with, you know, pushing for a, a socialist agenda. I mean, the, the, the campaign of Leodi de Guzman and Walden Bello, for example, were very important. They didn't get too many votes, but at least they opened up uh, discussions about future directions of the Philippines. Uh, how much of that should we push? How much of that can we push? And then there are members of the legislature. I mean, uh, right now the, the opposition is an absolute minority. Uh, Risa Honteveros has been at the forefront or will be at the forefront of leading a kind of uh, opposition in the legislature. And, 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 and there are many others, there's, there are a few others in, in, in the lower house that are also some is very skeptical and, and very critical of Marcos. I mean, to what extent can they pool their voices and form uh, a coalition to oppose the third? I mean, these are some of the things that uh, we need to we need to pay attention to. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much to all our panelists, uh, especially those in the Philippines. I know it's one a.m., so uh, we'll let you go so you can get some sleep. But uh, best of luck to you as you enter this new administration. Uh, and so thank you also again to our IPS team for helping to um, organize and promote this panel and to our sponsors as well and to the audience. Thank you so much for, for joining. Um, and so this will be, uh, this recording will be up on our website for future viewing or if you want to share with um, others. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks.